Tonight's speaker needs no introduction, but I'll give one anyways. <laughs> Matt Yost is a researcher, writer, and retired member of the Canadian Armed Forces, as well as this chapter's membership secretary and treasurer. He has presented on a variety of topics, including training Chinese Canadian pilots in the interwar years, resupplying dew line stations, and Operation Mana. He's currently writing a book and setting the record straight on Canada's First World War, all black number two construction battalion, and his research into training Chinese Canadian pilots is slated to become a three-part CHS journal article in the near future. Please join me in welcoming Matt Yost. Wow, okay, there we go. So part of the reason for picking this topic is that we often, or too often almost, hear about the air crew and officer leadership of the RCF. And yet there's another aspect of the RCF that uh, bears examination, the senior NCOs. In this case, if there was one name that was synonymous with Camp Borden and drill and discipline in the RCF's interwar period, it was out of Sergeant Major Class One, uh, Leonard John Dyke, also known as Iron Chest, as he was nicknamed by the RCF's airmen. Uh, you know, he wasn't an imposing man at five foot 11, 175 pounds, but his ramrod straight stance, booming voice, and personal dress and deportment made him someone who was greatly respected by officers and men alike. As you can see in this slide, he had a long and interesting military career. Uh, while the focus will be on these aspects, I will reveal some of the lighter side of his character but don't have time to do a complete review of uh, his uh, fun side of, and his serious side. Now, it should be mentioned at the start that there is a difference between Sergeant Major and Warrant Officer Class One. Sergeant Major is an appointment, a position granted to the senior NCO of an army unit, normally holding the rank of Warrant Officer Class One. Now, when Dyke started to serve with the RCIF, um, he was a member of the Royal Canadian Regiment, attached to the RCIF, and therefore still held the Army rank and the position of Sergeant Major. Um, Dyke was not the RCIF's first warrant officer, Class One. That honor falls to Harold H. Atkinson, whose service number was one. Even after he transferred to the RCIF, Dyke would continue to be referred to as Sergeant Major. Um, even though um, he was RCAF, you know, it's inexplicable, you know, why they mix the Army and uh, uh, Air Force ranks, I can't say, but you see him listed as both in all the uh, documents. Now, Leonard John Dyke was born on August 3rd, 1882 in Worcester, England, the youngest of three kids. The family came to Canada in October 1883, and he grew up in uh, Cayuga, Ontario. On enlisting in the Royal Canadian Garrison Artillery in July 1901, he indicated he was a sailor, although the 1901 census does not indicate his occupation and actually suggests he was more of a, a student. Dyke rose to the rank of sergeant before being discharged in July 1907. He then served as a policeman in Quebec City until enlisting in the 23rd Battalion of the CEF on the 2nd of November 1914. He proceeded overseas with them in February 1915 with the rank of sergeant. On arrival in the UK, the 23rd Battalion was broken up to provide reinforcements for other battalions. Sergeant Dyke was transferred to the 4th Battalion on the 26th of April, 1915, to serve as a company quartermaster sergeant. His first battle was Festubau from 15 to 25 May, in which over 2,400 Canadians were killed or wounded. The, the 4th Battalion itself only participated in the tail end of that battle. So Sergeant Dyke survived all of this, but on the 31st of May, he was struck in the head and shoulder 
by shrapnel from a shell that exploded behind him when he was in a trench. So he was one of roughly 110 soldiers who were injured over the few days that they were at the front. Now with a fractured skull and a large wound in his shoulder, Sergeant Dyke was sent to England to recover. This was going to be a long process as a shoulder wound kept reopening. The final result was that he could not raise his left arm above his shoulder and he could not carry a pack. So this disqualified him from ever serving at the front. The shrapnel also left him with a prominent scar on his shoulder and left or oh, sorry, on his head and left shoulder to go with the eagle tattoo on his left forearm. In April 1916, Sergeant Dite had recovered, but was, repa repa me, was repatriated and recommended to be discharged from the CEF because of limited movement of that left arm. In March 1917, he was taken on strength of number three district depot in Toronto but working out of Kingston. He was commissioned as a, a second lieutenant on the 21st of August that year and promoted to lieutenant on the 18th of April, 1918. Now at the district depot, Lieutenant Dite was able to assist returning veterans uh, through the first phases of their transition to civilian life. For a large part of 1917 and 1918, most of the soldiers that he was assisting were disabled ones. When the Kingston branch of the Great War Veterans Association was formed in July 1917, he was elected as its first vice president and soon thereafter became its president. He worked tirelessly in this capacity advocating for veterans, but stepped down in November 1918. The district depot was disbanded in October 1919, but they continued to help with closing out of the unit. On 29 February 1920, he was discharged from the CEF so that he could join the permanent force, enlisting in the Royal Canadian Machine Gun Brigade the next day with the rank of Sergeant Major Class 1 as part of the instructional cadre. He would transfer to the Royal Canadian Regiment in October 1922 as a member of their instructional cadre, again with the rank of Sergeant Major Class 1. On the physical activity side of the house, he helped organize and became the manager of the Indoor Military Baseball League in Kingston. He also served as an umpire when the league formed and began its uh, first games in February 1920. And during the summer, he played baseball for the machine gunners. When the RSF was formed on the 1st of April, 1924, Sergeant Major Dite was loaned to the RSF to keep the airmen of Camp Bourne in fine military form. In April, 1926, he was finally attached on command to the RSF for pay and administration. Interestingly enough, I've seen photos of him from 1924 where he's actually wearing an RSF uniform. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but officially he was still part of the Royal Canadian Regiment. For reasons unknown, it wouldn't be until the 1st of October, 1929, that Sergeant Major Dite would transfer to the RCAF. Unfortunately, his first activity form was to be hospitalized and on light duty for three months starting in mid-October. A small bone fragment in his left knee the result of a physical training incident in 1920, left him with a great deal of pain, with the result that it had to be removed. The, op the absence did nothing to diminish his stature. In December 1929, Wing Commander G.M. Croyle, the Camp uh, Gordon Commandant, thought him a great organizer and exceptionally intelligent and efficient. He also noted Dove, uh, Dyke's love of sports. Now, Sergeant Major Dyke's role at Camp Borden was to ensure that there was a high standard of dress, drill, and discipline in the RCAF. It started with the basic trainees, 
and then the staff at Camp Borden. They were there under his watchful eye and were continually reminded of the need to appear smart and dress and drill. And this carried on to the airmen who returned from operations with the uh, Civil Government Air Operations Detachments, who supported aerial photography, horse fire patrols, and other non-military flying that uh, was a large part of the RCAF in the 1920s. As they worked in small groups with only themselves to maintain discipline, they often returned from operations with dress and deportment almost forgotten. Um, Sergeant Major Dite provided them with the uh, stark reminder of what the RCF expected of them. Now, it started with the morning parade at which roll call was taken and an inspection was made after which the airmen would be marked to, the, to their workplaces. Sergeant Major Dite was not above using the officers to get his way. For instance, in March 1928, he used Flying Officer Kenneth McGregor Guthrie, later Air Vice Marshal, who was temporarily attached to Camp Borden as a means to have the airmen in the riggers and fitters shop upbraided for their dress. They had a tendency to wear black socks on their hands in the winter, likely as they cost less than the black gloves if uh, you were uh, working on something and destroyed whatever was over your hands. When Guthrie commented upon this, the Sergeant Major made a note, afterwards had the offenders uh, marching across the parade square, while the engine repair and airframe repair sections were virtually deserted. Now, the morning inspection often included the Sergeant Major's dog, Jiggs, a large collie who followed along several steps behind him. The collie was also known to go and uh, chase lone airmen who were crossing the uh, parade square. I think the collie understood that the parade square was Dites realm and nobody was gonna cross it there unless uh, there was a parade. Now, Dite also adopted and raised a fawn which he named Jimmy, with much support from his wife, Josephine, and which soon became a favorite among the members of the camp. He also planted and maintained a large flower garden that would be the pride of the station on visitors' days. Now, despite his gruff demeanor, Sergeant Major Dyke did have a soft spot for the airmen. He encouraged physical fitness through the sporting events, which were regular occurrences, Members of the camp's rugby, football, hockey, and baseball teams were readily able to receive leave to participate in local and distance events. At local uh, baseball games, he loved to officiate, his voice booming like any major league umpires. Now, as an aside, his love of sports likely rubbed off on his son, Leonard John, also known as Jack, who was an all round athlete played hockey well enough to play with the Chicago Blackhawks in the 1943-44 season and was a builder of community sports in uh, Barrie. Now, Sergeant Major Dyke was also an instructor. He instructed on several NCO courses at Camp Borden, as well as drill. In February 1932, he conducted a three-week course in Ottawa for drill instructors. The course included many current and future uh, Warrant Officer 1s and Warrant Officer Class 2s. Now, for those airmen who were given permission to leave Camp Borden on a pass or live off base because they were married, there was a uh, certain decorum that had to be maintained as well. All airmen carried swagger sticks under their right arm when marching and these had to be smartly transferred to the left arm prior to saluting and then transferred back to the right. For those who failed to do this uh, in a sufficiently high standard, he had remedial training. Now, this training consisted of take, take, taking two steps forward towards each of the large windows in the greenhouse at Camp Borden, saluting and then stepping back. Now, as there were roughly 1,200 windows in the greenhouse, the lesson was uh, not soon forgotten. Um, all the while, this was under the supervision of the Sergeant Major, 
and it was certainly in uh, line with his uh, dictum. Now remember that a good NCO doesn't have to lay uh, charges against his men. And I've seen very few charges um, in the interwar period that, that came out of a Camp Borden. Now the provisional pilot officers who trained at Camp Borden also fell under his spell. And yeah, he kept them in line too with their uh, dress and uh, drill. Now this was mainly during the drill practice that this happened, but it also was uh, when they went about their business in the camp. The air of authority around him had the uh, provisional pilot officers having to watch themselves lest they call him sir. Now, Dite was known as the drill guru of the RCAF, so he's called upon for major events. When uh, William Barker, VC, DSO and bar, MC and two bars, was killed in an aircraft accident in March 1930, the biggest funeral to date in Canada was held in Toronto for the war hero. It was Sergeant Major Dite who stood at the foot of Barker's coffin while he lay in state and carried his medals on a purple cushion in the funeral procession. And in all likelihood, he trained the 35 man guard of honor from the Camp Borden uh, section that led the uh, cortege. When the RSAF sent a contingent as part of the larger Canadian military contingent to the coronation of King George VI in May 1937, Sergeant Major Dite trained them, spending time with the Buckingham Palace Guard. Similar, he was in charge of preparing the Guard of Honor at Rideau Hall in Ottawa, when His Majesty King George VI and Queen Elizabeth were resident there in the May 1939 royal visit. Dite himself was also a member of Number Three Guard. So this was a Guard of Honor that was very similar to what they have at Buckingham Palace, where you have a changing of the guard ceremony several times a day. Now, with the Second World War and the expansion of the RCAF, someone of Sergeant Major Dyke's skill and knowledge could not be wasted. Drill and physical fitness were necessities, and he was the expert. It was also realized that basic training was going to be done across Canada and you need to have somebody who could provide a drill manual in order to be able to do that and have it at a high standard. They didn't get to that right away because in October, 1939, um, he was posted to Air Training Command in Toronto and was commissioned on the 15th of December. He would be the senior disciplinarian officer throughout his remaining service. Now, before he was posted to uh, Toronto, he organized the first RCAF precision drill team, showing off their abilities at the Canadian National Exhibition in August 1939. Training had begun at the start of July for this, and this continued into 1940 with personnel from number one Manning Depot, including an entire course of 70 service policemen. Now the squad performed 18 minutes of rifle drill all without a word of command. Over the course of the two weeks of the exhibition that started on August 23rd, this was the signature event of the exhibition and finished off each night's events. Now, Flight Lieutenant Dyke, by this time, put together a similar team for the 1941 CNE. On the 11th of October, 1941, Flight Lieutenant Dite formed a special 120 man demonstration team for use in special promotions, such as for uh, war bond campaigns and uh, RCF demonstrations in the United States. All of the airmen that were used for this were all prospective air crew trainees. So these weren't uh, people who were going to be uh, the mechanics and ground crew, these were going to be air crew. So here again, we see where potential officers are being affected uh, um, by uh, Dight and his uh, drill dress and demeanor. Now this 120 man demonstration team, first assignment was in uh, Kent, Ohio 
for Defense Day program, for which they left on the 16th, along with the trumpet band and the Ottawa Central Band. And they performed before roughly 50,000 people at halftime during college football game. On November 30th, 1941, they were in Boston at the Boston Gardens for a special display to raise funds for an ambulance service. Now, these precision drill teams likely harken back to the blindfolded drill teams that Sergeant Major Dyke trained and had to perform at sports days in the mid 1920s and 30s at Camp Gordon. Now, these drill squads, as I said, were not just for performance to create a favorable impression of the RCAF. There were times to use to promote war bonds and raise funds for other purposes. So this was a very high uh, profile activity in which he was uh, involved. With all the time that flight that Lieutenant Dyke was spending at number one Manning Depot, he was finally posted there on November 20th, 1941. And that's him in the middle of this uh, photograph. He would continue his magic with drill when in February 1942, he led the 195-man RCF band of precision drill team to New York City. On arrival at Grand Central Station, they formed up and marched to their hotel. This was the start of the RCF showcase for the premiere of the Warner Brothers film, Captain of the Clouds, starring James Cagney, Alan Hale, and Dennis Morgan. Now, in April 1942, Flight Lieutenant Knight was finally posted to RCF headquarters. The next month, he was promoted to squadron leader and became the RCF senior physical training and drill officer, which came under the disciplinary in that bracket as well. He chaired the committee that introduced and maintained the RCF drill manual. However, his time was not spent exclusively at Air Force headquarters. As part of his duties, he inspected the physical training and drill facilities at BTA ECATP schools. And an idea of how far uh, he could go and how busy this was can be seen in his schedule for the last part of 1942 and the start of 43. So on the 10th of August, 42, he was at number four bombing and gunnery school. And then on the 2nd and 3rd of November at number three bombing and gunnery, and then number seven bombing and gunnery respectively. The new year saw him visit number nine air observer school and on the 20th of January, number eight bombing and gunnery school. On the 26th, uh, it was number tw uh, two uh, bombing and gunnery. So you see, you know, he's visiting just these schools in which I found reference to, but I'm sure he visited a lot other as well. Now, these visits involved not just inspection, but also short, and by that I mean 45 minutes or so, uh, talks on deportment, discipline, and physical fitness to the assembled officers and non-commissioned officers at the school. His staff duties also involved managing the disciplinarian courses, including arranging the postings of the newly qualified disciplinarians. However, he could not escape uh, his reputation of organizing uh, parades. In May 1942, squadron leader Dyke trained and led the parade of 200 airmen and 200 airwomen who escorted the RCF's Allen Cup winning hockey team from the Chateau Laurier Hotel to the Ottawa Auditorium. When in late 1942, the RCF decided they needed a women's division precision drill team to showcase the WDs, it was squadron leader Dyke who was selected to train them. Now the WD learned 140 movements, all done without a word of command. However, instead of using rifles, they used swagger sticks. Now in mid-1943, the regulations finally caught up with squadron leader Dyke in the form of mandatory retirement age. He began his retirement leave on the 31st of July and in the ceremony at the Chateau Laurier Hotel in Ottawa on the evening of uh, the 1st of September, 
He was feted by his fellow, fellow senior officers from Air Force headquarters. He officially retired later that month. He lived his remaining years in Barry, close to his son. He was not forgotten in retirement, receiving the Queen Elizabeth II Coronation Medal in 1953. Now, Dierseth actually had more recognition for his service. In 1951, the drill hall at Camp Borden, what is now building A78, was renamed Date Hall in his honor. It was built in 1939 as a drill hall with a bowling alley and rifle range at the rear. And in 1995, the building became a recognized Canadian Federal Heritage Building. Now, what was unusual about all of this was that the building was named for a still living member of the RCAF. And that is not normal procedure. Now, for a period of time in the um, 80s and 90s, the building served as uh, an arena, then a curling uh, rink and archery range. But in the 2000s, it was reverted to more traditional military usage and has been used for change of command and graduation ceremonies. And in 2020, it even began to be used again for basic military uh, qualification courses, or in other words, basic training. Now, squadron leader Dyke passed away on the 6th of July, 1960. He received a military burial with Group Captain R.R. Hilton, representing the commanding officer of Camp Borden, and squadron leader Davis, representing training command headquarters. And I apologize for the quality of the next three photos because they came from uh, microfilm and they were quite dark. So I've tried to lighten them up. Now his guard of honor consisted of six squadron leaders while his funeral procession was an entire company of airmen. Such a large funeral was and remains highly unusual, um, especially for somebody of uh, the rank of squadron leader, but it shows the esteem in which he was held. Now, squadron leader Dyke was the epitome of professional excellence in the RCAF. He was an example and mentor to all airmen, and even officers who passed through Camp Borden in the interwar period, and even in the first four years of the war. As a Sergeant Major at Camp Borden, he was respected and perhaps even a little feared. Commissioned when the RCAF needed someone to take command of its drill and physical fitness requirements, he rose to the highest possible rank for his trade and it was only the regulations that kept him from serving longer uh, through the war. And that is the end of my presentation. Are there any questions?